I would sit across from, you know, clients or prospective clients. And I think a lot of their decisions would revolve around, around their children. You know, is this money going to be left for the children? You know, do the, the children have health care? Do they need health care? Things along those lines. And, you know, I, I understood on, on paper what they were going through and what they felt. But I think now that, that I do have a child myself and another one on the way, I can more empathize with that feeling and actually feel it myself. And I think it's, it's kind of, it's upped my game as an advisor at one point just from, you know, having that actual feeling firsthand. So, Mike, I have, one of the questions I've been, I would love to get your own words. I think I know the answers to this, but in your own words, when, when we looked at hiring advisors a couple of years ago, we were looking for one, maybe two. We ended up finding the right ones. And then just after that decision, you showed up on our doorstep. It sounds like you were baby dropped off at night, <laughs> but what, you showed up and, 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 aggressively said, hey, I'd really like to talk to you guys. And we were a little bit reluctant, but we we had that interview with you. And, and the moment you walked out the door back to your car, we all looked at each other and said, we, we can't not hire Mike. He's, he's really ideal for what we're looking for. And so you came to Stonehouse from a larger firm. Like you, you had worked with some experience at a larger, more national brand, if you will. Um, what was your thought process of why you chose this next chapter to be somebody like Stonehouse? Yeah, I think um, at the time I was looking for more of a home office feel, you know, kind of getting out of corporate America. And I think one of the the biggest things as far as investments go there is investment minimums. So the firm I was at had a, a minimum investment of $250,000. Sure. So a lot of people in my inner circle, whether it be family, friends, whoever it is coming to me for help might have 50, 25, $100,000. And the reality of it is, is that I couldn't do any business with them and I couldn't use the tools of the firm to try to help them out, which really turned me off to it, you know, because the biggest reason I got into the business was to try to help people out. And, you know, obviously the people I want to help out the most are people in my inner circle and it really didn't allow me to do so. Yeah, and I think I remember you talking about that. I think that was an important topic at that meeting, right? And and I think our answer was at that two years ago when we talked, as it is today, it's the same thing, which is there's not really a minimum, but the I guess the minimum amount is whatever value, whatever account size, we can make a difference, right? If we can bring value to, to somebody, bring it to the table, then we can work at 25000 right? Uh, and there's, gosh, there's a lot of people that, first start working with us at those smaller amounts and the next thing you know years go by or then they retire two years later and and now there are, there are more assets for us to help them sort through exactly um i think you know that there is something to it to having those high investment minimums because you as an advisor or you as a firm you're, you're going to make more money off of it right yep. but i think they're like like i alluded to in my previous answer there there's more to it in a sense of you know just being able to help out every person that comes through your door and, you know, you can help them out with, I was able to help them out with just, you know, my words and my knowledge, but not being able to, to leverage the firm and leverage the resources, you know, at my company to try to help those people out was, was somewhat of a turnoff for me. Yeah. All right. I'm going to shift gears on this one, if you will. And uh, hopefully it's not too personal of a question, but I know from what you shared with us that, that the way you sort of got exposed into money management, into, into handling finances was, was some some stuff that your family went through, right? Do you want to be willing to share a little bit about that backstory? Sure. So my mom was a stay-at-home mom pretty much most of her life. And then my dad ended up passing away when I was 18 years old. So she ended up becoming in charge of the finances, obviously, for the family and, and making some decisions that I don't think she was used to making pretty much her whole life. Right. So I had suggested to her it might be a good idea to go seek financial help and, and see a financial advisor. And after interviewing a few of them, you know, we did come across a guy that we liked and, and we trusted and had some good things to say to us. And we ended up using their services. And I think it was a, a huge turning point in my mom being able to make some some better decisions. And also some of that money that she was now in charge of had some good growth on it over the years. And it ended up being a decision that ended up paying dividends. And, you know, it's something that I saw him be able to make my mother and my family, you know, happy and, and make some changes for us that I wanted to be able to pay forward to some other people as well. Yeah. Drew you into the career. It did. Nice. 
So in your years of experience, Mike, in mm-hmm. this industry, do you see some things that kind of catch you by surprise? Like you talked about account minimums and that was important to you. So you could be able to, uh, the, the barrier of entry is a little bit more uh, progressive inside of Stonehouse. So if people, you, you can reach out to more and work with more people, I should say, uh, than you could in other firms. Uh, is there some understanding? People think they have to have a lot of money, right? To, to work with an advisor. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is, um, that's definitely one thing that I have seen. You know, people think that you need to have some certain amount of net worth or you need to be a certain amount um, close to retirement, certain amount of years close to retirement. I would say there really is no specifications on, on who should or who could go see an advisor. I would say the the sooner you get there and the, the more it's going to benefit you. I think when, when you wait too long to get close to retirement or you wait to, to build up that nest egg, I think there, there's opportunity missed there in waiting those extra years to come and see us. For sure. All right. Totally different topic. You ready for this one? Ready. No no lead way on this one. I'm just okay. going to tell you this answer. You are stuck on an island. You got one set of music to listen to for the rest of your life. One band, one singer. Who do you choose? I'm stuck on an island. One band, one singer. This is a good question. Um, I wouldn't want to go with something too intense. I wouldn't want to go with something that would put me to sleep either. I would have to say Zach Brown Band. Zach Brown Band. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that caught me off guard. Yeah. I did not know that about you. Yeah. Big, big country fan. Yeah. I kind of knew that part. I guess I just didn't realize that. All right. I, I'm not around you listening to music. You always got your head down on the computer. You're talking to people in the, in the conference room. Yeah. So I did not know that. Okay. What about one food? One food. For the rest of your life, man. That's, that's a hard question. I wouldn't want to eat any one food for the rest of my life. Um, By the way, when you talked about your song or yeah. your band, uh, the way you deduce that makes me laugh because that that's a financial planner mindset. Like, I don't want to have anything too much of this or too much too little of this. That's exactly where my brain's going with the with the food question <laughs> the too. Food. I'm like, well, I don't want to eat something that's going to make me feel bad all the time, but I also don't want to eat broccoli every day. I would have to go with. <laughs> I would go with. Does it have to be a meal or just one specific food? It doesn't matter. I All just right. say, I, I'm like, what's the, if like, I would go with, go-to food? I would go with a steak dinner. A steak dinner. Yeah. <laughs> That's very traditional. Of yeah, you. it tastes good and it'll also make me feel good too. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be able to hunt other animals and <laughs> it depends on what the island is. But, um, okay. I'm going to go back to some serious questions now. So, Mike, you are a fairly new father with another one on the way. Probably by the time this thing is... This video is out. You're probably going to be the proud daddy of two young children. So there, having had two children myself who are now in college, uh, there's a lot of change in your life. There's a lot of challenge. So what's what's going on in your life? What, what are the challenges of being a new dad? It's a great question. Um, I Other do. Than I, absolutely no sleep whatsoever. That's the, Fortunately, that phase is sort of passing us now, but it's also going to replay in about two and a half months. So. Yeah. I do. I have um, one one-year-old girl, and then I have another another baby girl expected on September fifteenth. So Perfect. some somewhere around that that range there. Um, as far as challenges, I mean, it's been it's been very rewarding for me so far. Um, we've been handling it pretty well, but th- there are definitely challenges with anything. I would say it, it's um, having the balance of you know making sure I'm I'm there for my clients and then there for my work and there for my business, but also you know making enough time to also be there for for Dom and and this baby and, and the next baby as well. All right. That makes sense. Is there anything else about being a dad, being a new parent, how it, did it shift your perspective or anything like that? Yeah, I would say it's um, it's also helped in, in, in being a financial planner as well. I think the the first half of my career, which we discussed on being with, with that bigger company, I was a, a childless advisor. I would sit across from you know clients or prospective clients, and I think a lot of their decisions would revolve around around their children. You know, is this money going to be left for the children? You know, do the, the children have health care? Do they need health care? Things along those lines. And you know, I, I understood on on paper what they were going through and what they felt. But I think now that that I do have a child myself and another one on the way, I can more empathize with that feeling and actually feel it myself. And I think it's it's kind of it's upped my game as an advisor at one point just from, you know, having that actual feeling firsthand. Yeah, that makes sense. And that transfers to when they retire, right? And when they start talking about retire, you're still pretty young. So you're a ways from your own retirement, but clients have feelings when they're going through retirement, right? They have a lot of, as, as my mom would say, a lot of agita. 
That's you know, right. Built up, uh, and so uh, it's good. It's good to have that perspective to know that there's more than, no matter what it looks like on paper, there's there's more going on in in your clients' minds, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, your sport of choice is my sport is, of I know this my answer. sport of choice is this day golf. <gasps> my most talented sport would be basketball. Okay. How tall are you? Six two. Six two. Okay. Yeah. You played basketball for where'd you go to school? Um, Mid Valley for high school and Marywood for college. Okay. Did you play in basketball? I played in high school, not college. Okay. One of the questions I like to ask is is sort of like not not what was your best day ever on the job, but um, days or or events I should say maybe experiences you've had or shared with clients where you literally get in the car, drive home that night, and you think. I, that's why I got in this job. That's why I do what I do. You know, you made a difference. So do you have anything like that that, that stands out to you? Sure. Um, I think there there are a few cases that stand out in, in my head as far as that goes. And I think a lot of times life throws you curveballs. Unexpected things happen. Sure. And there are a few clients I've had that have either had a health scare themselves or someone close in their family has had a health scare. Um, specifically one client that, that does stick out to me without getting too much into to detail about it. Um, their, their spouse is not sure how much time they have left and they were still working at their company, not sure if they can retire or not. And, um, I helped them put a plan together, help them realize that it, it is possible for, for them to spend however many remaining days there are together and, and without having to worry about going to work every day. Yeah, that's tough. It's it's and that's weird, right? Because it's a wonderful thing. So like you can make a difference to somebody and get them to levels that they didn't think they could get to, or you could keep them from imploding or, or falling down, right? So you don't know where you're going to make that difference on that that spectrum. But I guess your point is to be able to make that difference is yep. this job. It's a pretty unique thing that this job affords. It is. It's challenging at times, but also very rewarding. Yeah. Short and sweet, Mike. My last question is, where do you see yourself in 15 years? That's a tough question. Um, I would say I'm pretty happy with the work I do right now for the, for the clients that I do it for. And honestly, hopefully in, in 15 years, I'm doing the same exact thing I'm, I'm doing today, you know, helping clients get through some difficult times in their life. I'd imagine it's going to be in, in more volume, but similar work as today. Mm-hmm.